Welcome to the State of the Nation. South Africa is a state in crisis. We are having uh, blackouts for nearly half the day. The government wants to solve it with uh, car power ships. And uh, we need to know a little bit more about how we got here and uh, what the next step is. So joining me today is the one and only Mr. Wayne Divinage. Hello. Wayne. Hi, Mark. Nice Welcome to be here. back to the State of the Nation. Great. No, nice to be here again. Yeah. And uh, Wayne, you know, we obviously track uh, South Africa closely. Um, we've had the, the, the opportunity to speak to a lot of politicians, mainly opposition politicians, in fact, solely because uh, government politicians won't join us. Yeah. And uh, many analysts, and uh, not one of those conversations goes by without a big chunk of it being around electricity and the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know that you've come out stridently about car power ships, but aren't they the answer, Wayne? Isn't it that ships sail into the harbor and the next day the country is awash with electricity? No, uh, Mike, not at all. And this is the myth uh, and, and the agenda that uh, the car power ships and the proponents of this scheme are pushing. And the ministers are pushing quite heavily now. Uh, if they sign the deal today, it takes a year, sometimes more. In our case, it would be more before the first electrons start flowing into the grid. And, and uh, so it's not an overnight process. And secondly, it's 1,200 megawatts, which is about one stage of load shedding. So this notion that these, you know, we're in a crisis, bring the ships in, they're going to solve all our problems tomorrow is wrong. It's, it's uh, completely wrong. And it's going to solve one level of load shedding if it, it can get there. But it's far bigger than that, this issue. And, uh, and I can go into that and the costs and the, and the rationality. Well, let's, let's sort of go straight there because, uh, you know, it, it, one doesn't have to be an investigative journalist mm. to work out that, uh, that this was being touted mm. by our, our Minerals and Energy Minister, Gwedi Montashi, some time ago. Yeah. His uh, fat little nose was put out of joint when the car power ships were stopped, largely, as I understand, on climate issues in the environmental past. Uh, approvals but yeah. the big but the big outcry wasn't around the environment the big outcry was 20-year contract at an inflated price mm. why surely we need more permanent solutions and we've got un unperforming yeah. power stations yeah. of our own yeah so i just need to dispel this myth that uh, people who are going at art because we're in court on this we have been for a year now and then you're right it was Gwede Mantasha pushing this for an entire year and then suddenly there's another four ministers so something's happening in the background uh and now we're being accused of pushing a renewable energy agenda so let's just unpack that very quickly south africa has about seven and a half to eight percent of its energy mix from renewables europe is at three times that 23 percent so we've got a long way to go the, 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 uh, the energy specialists, and these are guys that do all the modeling. This is from CSR, from Meridian uh, Consulting and that. They know their stuff. Had government, had Gwede Mantashe approved uh, the renewable energy options that were available to us over the last five years, as we sit here today, we would have no load shedding or maybe level one load shedding. So they have procrastinated on these deals. They've created this crisis that we have. Doesn't mean to say it's too late to go down those roads. And if you start now with some of those renewables, they'll be up and running before car power ships comes along. So we're not here to push an agenda of nuclear or gas or coal or, or renewables or any, anything anti those. What we want is the best solution for the country. And that needs to be done in accordance with the integrated resource plan, which needs to be updated every two years or so. It's a long-term plan, and it looks at what is coming off stream, old coal plants and that. What can we bring onto stream? What are the costs? So what is the best solutions and the best cost for this country and our energy needs over time looking forward? And that's not what they're doing. They're not updating it. So this is what you happen to have. If you don't have a plan, you start shooting from the hips, and you hear Jose Enzo Ramachopa, the new electricity minister, saying – hey, let's go and extend these old coal plants which are supposed to be coming off stream with no plan, no idea, no idea of the cost and whether it's possible and how long that'll take. Then you have Gwede Mantashe saying, well, let's bring in the power ships. And it's so sad to see our country run in this irrational way. 
and, 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 and we've got a history of watching government's rationality. Rationality means, is this best? Does it make sense? Let's unpack why you want to bring on certain solutions. The car power ships is the most irrational one for the reasons I've told you. Plus, government tells us, and we believe that process, that in the next year, the Madupi uh, uh, plant, that, uh, the, the one unit that blew up with the, with the boiler, will be on stream. That uh, the three units at Kusili, and that's about uh, two, 2,000 megawatts, will come on stream um, uh, from, from the chimney that collapsed. Uh, finishing off now the uh, life extension of Kuburg, two of those units, and then you've got the six main power stations that we're needing to keep uh, uh, maintained and up to speed. If all of that starts to happen and happens in the time frame that they tell us, then we don't need car power ships. But now let's go into car power ships. In two, 20, uh, 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 2021, when they were granted the generation license, NERSA grants them the license, before they've got their environmental uh, uh, approvals, before they've got the Ports Authority approvals, before they've got the uh, uh, financial um, disclosures and, and, and ESKIM's uh, procurement uh, uh, approvals. So how does the regulator, who's supposed to look after our interests, start issuing a generation license when none of that stuff's done? And the biggest issue is the f economic impact of the car power ships because you don't, you don't try and kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer. And that's what they're trying to do here. And there's a lot of money to be made when you start uh, 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 looking deeper at this. So in 2021, when they granted the uh, generation license, they put the scheme at 220 billion rand over 20 years, costing about 1 rand 50 per kilowatt hour. Renewables cost 40 cents per kilowatt hour. Coal is between 1 rand 35 and 1 rand 50. Now that was before the Ukraine war, and that was when the rand was trading at 14 rand to the dollar. It slumped by 35% and getting worse, the rand exchange rate, and the price of gas has gone up double the price. In fact, it was three times the price until uh, quite recently. Uh, so now you be held into this fluctuation, wild fluctuation in gas price and the, and the rand dollar exchange. At today's uh, exchange rates and cost of uh, gas, that kilowatt hour price is now closer to three rand per kilowatt hour and going much further. So you, now you're talking about a 500 billion rand noose around this country's neck for 20 years. And you say to government, 20 years, this is an emergency uh, 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 risk mitigation program. Why you want to lock this country in for 20 years? Then suddenly they start to realize, well, that's, that's you know, our, our, our um, opposition to this. All these things I'm telling you about is starting to, to come to the fore, and it's of, you know, they're struggling to answer questions. So they make comments like, okay, but maybe it should be shorter. Maybe we'll do it for 10 years. Well, not 10 years if you've got a two-year crisis. Uh, maybe we could consider five years. I mean, we're not opposed to it, if it just makes sense. But you know what happens when you start bringing the 20 years down to five years? At cost per kilowatt hour starts shooting up because there's a, there's a land side infrastructure process that has to be put in place. And those ships need to recover some of their money and they would like to stretch this cost as long as they can to lower the cost per kilowatt hour. So if you want to reduce the time period, that cost now is going to go to five rand per kilowatt hour. And we've got options that will reduce and the problems on, on load shedding at, at uh, 34 to 40 cents an hour, a kilowatt hour. What is government smoking? And then you start realizing it's not partially or somewhat irrational. It is so grossly irrational. And in my CEO piece uh, this month, we talk about irrational government decisions. There's two factors around irrationality. Incompetence, as bad decisions got based on wrong information and everything. And they're not that stupid on this. They, they make a lot of dumb decisions on a lot of things, ETOLs, many of these things. But, and even the ETOLs one, it's not, it's not about the incompetence in these cases. It's about other hidden agendas. There's a ton of money to be made here for a long period of time. That's what this is about. We call a spade a spade when you smell a rat and it's in the kitchen and it's a big rat. It stinks. This stinks of a few people going to make mega billions of rands and you and I are going to pay for it and our kids for generations to come. We have to stop it. And government needs to realize that they cannot just continue uh, with these outrageous decisions.
Yeah, I think that uh, part of the decision making process, um, you know, if if, if one's uh, if anybody's watching this and wondering why you're saying some of the things that you're saying, one needs look, I think, no further than uh, the fact that at the beginning of 2023, the ANC couldn't pay their salary, their staff mm. salaries. Mm. And suddenly, uh, we've had no more complaints from their staff receiving their salaries. So clearly, they're doing something right. Their well, they got a big working. injection from Parliament. The yeah. ANC went after their December conference, said, oh, we need more money. They passed a, 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 a change in the budget. And um, Ina Khodungwana uh, dished out another 300 million rand to the political parties. The ANC gets uh, the bulk the of that. Of that. Yeah. Uh, 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 that was in the last financial year, which wasn't budgeted for. And they've given it to them in this new financial year. It's crazy that the uh, political parties get all this money. And that's just a small part yeah. of what they get from the government. But back to uh, car power ships. Um, where is this process now? Because one never knows. Um, you know, we, we are getting accustomed, sadly, to these bad decisions, these irrational decisions, as you put, it, mm. as you put them. Uh, suddenly, uh, after all the fight has taken place and it seems like the issue has been buried, suddenly the ships steam in. Where is well, the process? Well, they're not going to steam in. So a year ago, in February last year, in April last year, I think it was, we filed papers against Dursa and their decision to have this decision reviewed in court. And what that means is that, um, is that we want to see the record, how they arrived at this decision, what made them grant this license. And, the, and there's, they broke a number of rules uh, or processes that had to follow before they could. So that's the one area. And we want to see the economic impact and, and how did they apply their mindsets? What did they, how did they arrive at the one round 50? Uh, you know, I mean, even there it might be more than uh, a one round 50 per kilowatt hour. And they won't give us this information. For a year now, longer than a year, back and forth, and we're saying, you know, they keep hiding behind this, oh, but this is, uh, this is confidential information. Well, let's go. We've asked them this. Let's go and have a private session with the judge, and we'll have a private interlocutory challenge on, well, what is so confidential that we, that we the public, who have to pay this, uh, are not allowed to know about? And if there's trade secrets, uh, you know, Let's hide those. We don't need to see that. Uh, but let us see the entire decision. Where are the costs? Uh, uh, how do you arrive at uh, all of this? Because uh, our modeling done by specialists are showing that there's something grossly wrong. So for a year, they've procrastinated. They've put up barriers. They've slowed the process down. And we say, fine, we're not going away. You can't bring the car power ships into this country while there's a court process on in place. You, if you want to, that's fine. You can bring them in and start, but if the court rules in our favor, you have to dismantle all of that. It's a massive risk to them. So the banks, no one's going to finance this. Uh, and, and government can't even finance the infrastructure build on, 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 on the land side of, these, uh, of this process until the court challenge has been cleared. And that's not going to be, we're not going to just lie down and allow them rule. If they say, okay, we're going to start again because we're going to bring it down to 10 years, it's a whole new deal. They have to start again. They have to go get all the approvals. And they have to get public consultation, and we'll, we'll go really hard and, and strong. And if again, if it doesn't make sense, we'll interdict it, and we'll stop it there. Not because we don't want gas-powered ships, not because we don't want nuclear anything. We want transparency. We want what's best for this country. And as we've always said, transparency is the enemy of corruption. And where there's a lack of transparency and irrational decisions, there's another big ticket. That's another big tick, another big red flag saying something stinks here. Was, uh, Wayne, it all starting to sound like that was the thinking behind the uh, president's announcement of the, st the, the short-lived announcement of the state of disaster around electricity. Mm. Was that to ram home this kind of decision? We think so, which is why we went to court and challenged them on that state of disaster. Uh, and they could see they were going to lose and they pulled out. Uh, and they agreed to pay our costs, and, uh, and they withdrew that state of disaster. We realized and thought, well, one of the reasons was for that. And, and there were a number of others. Uh, that's not, so that's not the only reason why we took them on. Uh, and within a couple of months of them realizing they were going to get a hiding in court, they, they, they pulled the plug on the state of disaster. Now, you know, in, in a, a state of desperation, never mind the state of disaster, because, uh, the, you know, the... the 
the ANC may have wanted a state of disaster, but they've managed to push the South African public into a state of desperation where mm. we are willing to almost accept anything. And yeah. you're even hearing rumblings from some of the normal uh, quarters that uh, uh, our ex-president Zuma was correct when he was talking about uh, Russian nuclear power. <laughs> Do you see that uh, raising its head again? Yeah, no. I mean, the, 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 again, ra irrational statements like that will be made. But, uh, you know, people were saying but if you had allowed Zuma to bring in uh, nuclear in, in, in 2017 when, the, when it was being challenged, if you didn't challenge it, uh, we would have nuclear. No, doesn't that happen like that? You don't build a nuclear plant in, in, in five years. They would have only been starting to build that after going through all the motions and the procurement processes by about 2019, 2020. And it takes seven to ten years to build nuclear. We didn't need the nuclear. Most expensive uh, electricity and, and this car power ships one. We didn't need it. We don't need it. We must follow the trends of the world. The world is moving to renewable energy. This whole thing on base uh, uh, load and that, uh, it, is, it, is, it is handled through a mix of coal, of, of hydro, which we have, peaking plants and so forth, uh, some gas, not necessarily gas ships, uh, but gas and uh, and and renewables and everyone thinks well, the, yeah, but the, the the sun doesn't shine at night, but the wind blows. You know, renewables is not just solar. There's wind. There's uh, there's wave motion uh, uh, energy, free energy from the sea. And I was speaking to the mayor of uh, Soldana, and they're putting in a, a energy plant uh, from wave motion. There's around the world, these things are there. So let's follow the world trends. And if we're still at seven eight percent of renewables, and and the world is. Uh, in, in, in many countries, Sweden, 60%. I know they've got hydro and, uh, and, and, and uh, thermonuclear and other stuff. I mean, uh, uh, geothermal energy. But just look at the, glow of the big picture. We are still a long way off where we should be on renewables that would reduce so much of the pressure of load shedding today. But in the meantime, uh, as we record this to the gentle hum of the generator in the background, mm. um, you know, South Africans are desperate right now. Yeah. And uh, you can't help but look at, uh, at our existing coal fleet yeah. running at 50% efficiency. Yeah. Well, they've got to be fixed. There's an energy plan. They are focusing on the six the longer-term ones. They have to decommission uh, some of the old ones. You might want to extend one or two for a, a few years longer. But I think the biggest thing is get these current coal-fired plants up to operating efficiently. Fix Kusile. Fix Madupi, and sadly they were built badly designed. They'll never run at 100% efficiency, 80% is what I've heard ma maximum, but still that's better than where they are right now. So get all of that. Deal with the corruption within Eskom. Deal with the sabotage. Not difficult stuff. You know, they, they castigate Andre de Reiter. Of course, a lot of his stuff is just information and intelligence, but when you delve deeper into the intelligence, you can find some of the solutions to take out the, the, the corrupt entities that are slowing us down, that are putting a lot of uh, barriers in the way of making sure those power plants run efficiently. Deal with the, uh, finish off with the, uh, uh, the life extension of Kuburg, costing a lot more, taking a bit longer than it should have. Uh, and, uh, and, and bring on the renewables, bring on uh, the, the independent power producers. Uh, and, and, you know, it's sad to see uh, the rural guys lose that case in Frankfurt uh, where the people have invested, the local community has invested, and then, you know, ask them on a technicality. I think if that's challenged, they will win it. But we should have towns like that, towns like uh, Prince Albert and in the Karoo, taking themselves almost off grid. They are, there's so much sunshine and wind uh, uh, down there. And when you start doing that uh, to 50, 60, 100 municipalities, you reduce the load on Eskom. And then we fix load shedding. It's a journey. And, and, and the amount of people that are going off grid anyway, businesses and households, so that's all reducing the pressure on Eskom. And I think if you take all of those factors into account, we don't need nuclear. We don't need car power ships, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, is that making a significant contribution to our electricity shortfall, these, uh, uh, you know, more sort of domestic... Um it's, it's having an impact over time because it's, it's, there's bank financing in that. Uh, people are going, uh, reducing their need on, on Eskom Energy. Businesses, like you cannot believe, uh, mines. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely... 
Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but if you if you look at it in a year from now and you look at it now compared to a year ago, it's it's exponential, and it's going to get up into the four thousand megawatts over the next few years, and that's a big reduction. Yeah, it's four stages. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. But now part of uh, of the short term solution when we did finally at some point hear from our president, who's obviously not very. Um, keen to face the nation or to even face his uh, fellow members of parliament. Uh, he had a two-pronged strategy. One was a state of disaster. Uh, none of these strategies were physical as to what was actually going to happen, but one was a state of disaster. The other one was the appointment of a minister of electricity mm. who seems to be um, uh, sort of a, uh, just for, for those that remember, sort of an Abdul Bamji type of character mm. who, who runs around sort of uh, dancing almost like yeah. dancing around yeah. Uh, yeah. looking happy and singing a tune and and uh, and not you know saying a lot but saying nothing yeah i think the whole idea of appointing an electricity minister was wrong and i'll tell you why you've got two ministers dealing with the energy issues in this country and we see this in business where businesses fail uh, from time to time is if you don't hold those people to account and deal with the issues to fix the energy crisis there you start throwing people at the problem. So they say, okay, well, they're not fixing it. We, we, we don't want to hold them to account. There are ministers. There are uh, cadres. So we're just going to pop in another uh, minister to take care of this energy crisis. That'll solve the problem. Well, it never does. It creates obfuscation. It creates gray blurring of the gray lines as to who's responsible for what. And it, uh, it creates less accountability. So you've actually got a bigger problem now. Not, uh, it's not being addressed. The uh, president just promulgated the powers uh, of the electricity minister today, and we've been reading through those, so section 34.1 uh, and, and 2, and some of 2, it like reads uh, uh, some of the relevant uh, clauses in, in, in section 34.2 are going to uh, be handed over to the new minister. Well, which ones? I say it's relevant, uh, powers, but which ones are relevant? And, and then section 1. Now, what this basically means is that the minister now can go and procure, can go and enter into contracts, can go and decide on which sources of energy are, are going to be taken on. And we're saying, well, hold on, there's an integrated resource plan. It's a bit old, 2019, but that's the guiding plan. Not you saying, okay, I think we should extend the power plants or the old ones uh, without a plan. Stick to the plan. That's how businesses run. That's how countries run. You have uh, you know, 15, 20, 30-year plans for th stuff like this. And there's knee-jerk reaction uh, coming from these decisions. So uh, sadly, you know, we have now three ministers trying to sort out the mess, and, and each one's pointing at each one now, saying, well, uh, you know, it's your fault. And, and uh, uh, Praveen Gordon has been saying to Gwedi Matash, but had you brought on the IPPs, we wouldn't have had this problem. Uh, well, had you fixed Eskom, we wouldn't have had the problem. And it's just, it's just crazy. So, Wayne, uh, tell, explain to the people that are watching this. Um, in the case of, uh, of an irrational decision mm. like a car power ship, let's just, let's just say it mm. goes ahead, you lose, they win, whatever. We enter into a bad 20-year contract followed by a, a, a deal with, uh, br uh, with uh, the Turks. With, yeah, that's yeah, with no. the Turks. And then a, a deal with Putin, on, Vladimir on, Putin, on to nuclear. bring nuclear yeah. in. And we have all of these irrational decisions taken by government, right? Now, let's just imagine for a second, it through, yeah. right? And it proves to be terribly unpopular. And, uh, you know, come the next election arrives and a new government gets elected. Mm -hmm. A new party is, is the ANC loses power. Yeah. What options are open to a new government into to reversing those irrational decisions in international law, is there yeah, something? Yeah, there, there, there are. There are opportunities. So first of all, uh, we've got a good court system, and we will At make the moment, sure. Yeah, yeah, but 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 we'll push the irrationality arguments to the extent that a court uh, should never, in their right minds, grant these licenses based on just the some of the stuff I've told you. And if and if one court does, there's a supreme court and there's a constitutional court. Those that we'll go through that whole yes. process. Um, and that in itself changes things very, very quickly. You know, if you don't start this in a year and suddenly the load mm. shedding drops down to level three and two because we've got our house in order and a new government comes on stream and starts doing the work that the ANC should have been doing and haven't been doing, mm. 
we'll be able to stop it. But let's say they, they, they try and force it. And there's not just these deals, by the way. There's a lot of quick, rush, long-term contracts being signed in, in national, provincial, and local government levels because of this fear that is coming, mm. uh, potentially through um, coalition governments, if we can get those right, and to work at a national level. And so what we're seeing in government spaces is, is a lot of long-term contracts being signed. Now, our warning to the people and the suppliers of the services as long-term contracts is, is if there's any proof that those were irrational decisions, that they were not in the best interest of the people, and we can prove that to the courts and find uh, uh, the people involved in the enrichment processes, they will all be undone. They might take a while, but they will be fought in court, uh, and this is what we have to start doing. The frenzy of the corruption that's unfolding right now, I cannot tell you. Uh, what's happening, Mike, uh, right down to local government level. I mean, we are paying three, four, five times the price we should for classrooms, unnecessary spending like you cannot believe. Uh, people are coming at us with so much information. We just can't get to everything. It's so sad. But this government, this ruling party, is extremely corrupt. They thrive on, uh, on, on deals that are done uh, that from which they or their cronies connected people uh, um, benefit from. Now, there's another thing that this government does that I think is extremely uh, damaging and to which most of us become complicit. Mm -hmm. And that is that they are, they are masters at, at getting us to speak their language. Uh, the, the idea that um, uh, we don't call it blackouts, we call it load shedding, <coughs> is, yeah. is the one that everybody's sort of touting at the moment because, you know, let's yeah. not give it a nice name. Yeah. Another thing that, uh, that I think uh, one has to stop doing is blaming Eskom. Yeah. Eskom, I was, I was looking this up since 2007, has had 14 CEOs. Yeah. Right? Now, in those 14 CEOs, you know, most of them were admirable people with great CVs, etc. It's not a hard um, examination as to what's gone wrong at Eskom. We no. can work that out. You and I yeah. can work that out and neither yeah, of us are CEOs. Yeah, and motives. And so we understand that the yeah. problem has mm -hmm. been malfeasance, corruption, etc. Very easy to spot. Mm. Yeah. But yet not one of those 14 CEOs has, um, was aided in any effort, if they took one, to get rid of, of uh, you know, to, to remedy that situation. Mm. But interestingly, and I see it happening just at the moment, um, the, the ANC and the government climbs on the bandwagon in blaming the CEO. <coughs> yeah. And it's not just an Andre de Reiter thing. It's been blamed Jabu Mabuza until the poor guy died. Mm. You know, uh, just blame the CEO. The next CEO is going to be better and give him no assistance and then blame the CEO. So, mm. you know, what you've got to recommend is people stop blaming Eskom as such because the problem isn't necessarily Eskom. And it's the entity the is run by people, and yeah. the, the people have to take the responsibility. Uh, I think, uh, firstly, on the Andre de Reiter matter, you know, it's easy to shoot uh, and castigate him instead of what government should have been doing and saying, okay, Andre, there were things you could have done better, and they probably mm. were, uh, or done differently, but you know something that's going wrong, so let's get to the bottom of that. But they don't. But they want to, they want to look deep enough. Let me give you another example. When Brian Malefe was the CEO, um, big money comes in the coal contracts and the coal supply to Eskom. So, uh, so what does he do? Uh, you know, we had a lot of collieries, coal collieries tied to the uh, uh, the mines tied to Eskom, uh, to the power plants. So you're getting it at a cost. Mm. Cost, you know, what cool. costs you to get out the ground? Eskom owns that, straight onto the conveyor belts, into their burners, all managed. No, nope, let's outsource this. Uh, his famous words were, I don't want to own the bakery, I just want to buy the bread. From the bakery well uh, any businessman will tell you if you're consuming all the bread from the bakery best you own the bakery mm. you already own them what are you doing here well what he was doing was giving great opportunities to push up the primary energy cost of coal for these coal power and you have the trucking companies coming in the mines well i don't have to tell you anymore mm. yeah absolute mess one just has to take a trip to Mpumalanga from Johannesburg to see what well, it's like. Well, some towns have stopped these trucks from going through their towns. You've yeah. seen that. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, clearly, um, you know, we, we don't have an Eskom problem. We have a government problem that refuses to deal with, the, with what are very visible problems. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, this isn't very hard to do it. And uh, I see, you know, even watching on BBC News to see they've, they reported just 
drive up to a coal mine and you can see exactly where the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. He has a reporter. This isn't, uh, yeah. this isn't, I'm not a policeman. Obviously, police play a role. And, you yeah. know, we've got uh, our cat in the hat, Becky Taylor, mm -hmm. who seems to do absolutely nothing. No idea. Now, um, Wayne, there's, uh, there's obviously South Africa is uh, heading, um, <coughs> we, we are in, in quite a difficult situation. Yeah. Growth is completely constrained yeah. by the, 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 the power, crisis, the energy yeah. crisis, yeah. because, I mean, quite simply, how can you grow if you have no power? Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it, it seems impossible. Mm. The rand is tanking. Um, do you see any way out of this current malaise? You know, um, it is tough, uh, but without a doubt, there is there is a way out, and it all comes down to leadership. So 2024, we can't always just say we're going to hang our hat on 2024. Mm -hmm. But in a year's time, literally the middle of next year, um, uh, within a few months of that, uh, we should have the next elections. And if we can get the voter turnout up, in other words, stop this notion by many who've voted for a ruling party for many years and said, I'll give up, I've had enough of them, so I'm just not going to vote. You've got to change that mindset. You need to vote for the least bad thereafter. There has to be somebody else. And never have this idea that, well, none of the other parties resonated with me 100%, therefore I'm not going to vote. That's the worst thing you do. We're down to 46% of our voter turnout or potential voter turnout in the last election. All the indications on the research shows that if you can get the voter turnout back up, Get the youth back on board. They don't. They're not registering. Uh, because if you look at failing economies around the country, you see this: people just give up voting, and they 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 opt out of democracy. We don't need that. We want people to opt in, understand their power, and the change they can bring. And if we can get that right, and there's a number of uh, NGOs that are going on massive programs to get registration up, to get uh, people to understand abstaining is the worst option then we could see a coalition now coalitions is a bit of a swear word but what people don't understand is that out of the 35 coalitions most of them are working mm. and working very well around the country they're not working in Joburg and they're not working in Chwani and Akurilini three of the big metros and these are the teething pains that we have to go through through coalition politics but at a national level so that's a local level national level it might be a little bit different but what we need to also convince our politicians is to put their egos aside, grow up and fix. And if you get the right leadership in, it's very fast. Turning a country around is not difficult, especially off a low base. And you see it in Rwanda, you see it in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, as you see it in, 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 in southern Korea. Many, many countries, uh, Zambia and I, just go to Zambia and see what's happening since HH came on board and took over the country a, a year and a half or so ago. Very rapid to uh, get the psyche and the mindset and the, and the people working for prosperity. You only have to put in 10, 15 different real strong agendas around business efficiency, enabling business, because it's not government that creates jobs, it's business that creates jobs. Uh, and I'm very excited about the opportunities because the prosperity potential of this country yeah. is massive. So the, it can happen, it, and it should happen, and we've got to make it happen. Mm. And, and that's why civil society and organizations like ourselves, Corruption Watch, uh, uh, Ahmed Katrada Foundation, there's a number of good, uh, hardworking entities that, that are holding government to account. Well, uh, we are going to do our little bit by doing that. And that is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's hot off the press, but we are going to have a live State of the Nation event at the Santon Convention Center, which will feature... John Stiernes and Herman Mashaba Songhez or Zibi, quizzed by Davi Ruet, Sandile Swani, and a few people so that the business community can attend a, a breakfast like that yeah. and actually see whether the opposition are worth supporting or not because they need the support. Yeah. But I'd like to just sort of uh, um, deal with one issue because uh, I recently interviewed uh, Charles Saliers from the Patriotic Alliance. Yes. And he doubled down on what Kenny Kunene had to say that Robert Mugabe was right in banning NGOs. Yeah. <laughs> right? And we, heard, we heard recently Mantasha was saying the NGOs are getting in their way in all these environmental matters. But there's a great article in the Daily Maverick from WESA responding to that. It's absolute nonsense. Yes. So yeah. you don't feel threatened as somebody that uh, works for an NGO? You don't think that... Uh, 
these forces of darkness because let's understand the patriotic alliance is in coalition with the ANC and uh, you've got influential people like Guidi Mantashe saying this. Do you think there could uh, be war declared on, or there's probably war already declared on NGOs, but do you think they could take it a step further? Is there a way they could No, they, they, could they, they can't. NGOs? Our constitution is very, very strong. Unless they want to go and damp with the constitution. And uh, uh, No, we've never felt threatened. Uh, we always feel so. People who, people who worry about the strength of NGOs are not realizing why we are, have to be strong. That's because there's so much that's going wrong. If it wasn't for NGOs like uh, the Treatment Action Campaign, we would have had a big AIDS disaster. Is he, is he saying a Treatment Action Campaign was wrong? Is he saying the NGOs that are providing the feeding schemes for starving children are wrong? Is he saying that the NGOs that are running education programs to help kids not slip into this unemployable space are wrong? I mean, he's crazy when people say that. We, we hear and we exist for a reason. Let me tell you, if we had to lay down and just allow the ETOL matter to, to happen, 1% of South Africa's roads would have been paying 30% uh, of Sandwell's income. That's a, an abusive situation. The profits would have flowed offshore, billions of rands a year. Uh, it was grossly irrational. It had to be stopped, and a civil disobedience campaign brought that to an end. Uh, the NGOs that bought the append of, uh, end of apartheid were very necessary uh, through the United Democratic uh, Front. I mean, where does he come from that NGOs are, are, are bad? We have a role to play to keep government honest. Uh, and, and only those who feel threatened by NGOs need to look at themselves in the mirror and say, we, NGOs don't just mushroom out because people have got time on their hands and money to waste. Yeah, I've got a life to live. I've got, I could have been in the corporate world uh, with, with shareholding in companies and running a non-profit entity with no equity. And we're passionate about this stuff. And it's hard work. Let me tell you, and it costs a lot of money. And, the, and we only exist because the public support us. And the public don't want to fork out money to NGOs, but they see the need. So anybody who castigates NGOs, uh, uh, I, think they, I think they're part of the problem, quite frankly. Well, the same people that are castigating NGOs are advocating for a scrapping of the Constitution. So, you yeah, know, well, there go figure. Yeah. So, but I, but I think you, your point is well made that that some of the gains, no, not some of the biggest gains made in South Africa, have been made by a uh, a very motivated public, motivated yeah. to support those yeah. those very necessary campaigns. Yeah. Uh, the South African public right now feels defeated. Yeah. I don't blame them. Do Dejected. you think there is the motivation to fight against the ultimate fight, you know, the, the, the mega death match, which is the war on the courts and the war on the Constitution, which seems to be inevitable? Uh, no, I don't think they are, are inevitable. Um, we've got a strong Constitution. You can't just change it right now. The government doesn't have yeah, but the, who protects uh, it enough. Like? Well, look, the courts are, are strong. Yeah, the, the, but, uh, but, but I mean, without sort of, I'm not, I'm, you know, without sort of being that guy, I'm saying mm. the courts rely on somebody else to implement what the court decides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's why um, the courts are very, very busy and they snowed under and undercapacitated, which is why we've got to fight, fight for those rights. But let me just put it this way. With the potential that we have, a lot of people have invested so much in this country, they can't leave. They can't. There's no South uh, yeah. Zimbabweans had to go. Uh, Australia is not the answer. In fact, you speak to people who have left, they say it's no different to many parts of the world, the problems, the, the, the abuse of power in, in many countries. So we've got a lot to fight for and a lot to stand up for. And I think this notion that we are a divided country is also wrong. The research has also shown that we are more integrated and more supportive of each other than we've ever been. There are a few people there are a few thousand people out there that push these agendas, these populist agendas, to try and, and create the chaos for obvious reasons. And we just need to remind ourselves that we are a diverse nation, that we are uh, on, the, on the journey to fix this country, and we cannot give up. When you give up hope, then you must then leave, then switch off the lights. It's too much here. We're in a dire situation. Uh, the cities are breaking and crumbling uh, because the local uh, uh, governments are, are, are mis mismanaging it. Ratings Africa put out their their uh, ratings index on financial sustainability of towns and cities around the country. 
And I don't punt any political agenda, but if you look at the correlation, 100% correlation between municipalities that work and that are financially viable and those that aren't, it's all political. It's all political. And if you change the political world, I was speaking to the mayor of Saldana Bay yesterday. Um, I wish you could hear this guy. He is so customer-centric, so citizen-centric. Uh, and what they're doing for that town. And Midval, uh, these mayors, they are so visionary. And they're not, yeah, and, and I'm getting, and they're not, not looking for uh, solutions for the next uh, year or two. They're looking well beyond their time, their five year period. They're looking 20 and 30 years ahead, putting an in infrastructure now for them. That's how you run towns and cities. And what do we have in Joburg? You know, uh, people that don't have the qualifications. This is the biggest. This is the biggest economy, uh, city economy in, in the continent, and, and certainly in our country. Uh, you know, think of people that are put in charge of multi-billion rand businesses. Lots of experience, qualifications, surrounding themselves with thought leaders. And our politicians play around with our lives and our investments in the way they are. Uh, it's shocking, eh, quite frankly, and we've got to change that. Well, Wayne, you mentioned that uh, South Africa was united and nothing has united South Africa more than uh, the, the, the sort of discomfort felt um, by the, the electricity crisis. You know, I think to anybody watching this today, Alta has fought some good fights and here comes another big one. There's no doubt that the ANC want to get those car power ships in here almost, even if it means that they go and torch the existing coal stations themselves. Yeah, they want to get those car power ships in and it's only going to be us that gets them focusing on where the solutions should be rather than uh, the, the irrational plans yeah. that they'd like to implement. Yeah. Wayne Divinage, if you love the work that Wayne's doing, please go onto the outer website. Please contribute to them because uh, we heard a lot from you about uh, court cases and things. These things don't pay for themselves, yeah, millions costs a lot of money. Um, Wayne and uh, what the people at Outer are doing are, is very important to this country. Thank you so much for joining us on the State of the Nation. Thanks it's been so a bit depressing, but at least we all know where we stand. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least we can, we can pass on the information to everybody that's joined us. Please subscribe to the State of the Nation channel. If you really love us, become a member. Just uh, become a supporter of uh, State of the Nation. This also costs money, and uh, we look forward to, to getting more from you, Wayne, as the story unfolds. Thank you so much, and to everybody that joined us, thank, thank you. you. We'll thank, see you again Thanks soon. for that, and also it's www.arta.co.za. It takes five minutes to sign up. And this notion that, uh, what's my 100 rand a month going to do? is sad you know the biggest mistake is made by those who give nothing because they could only give a little i think it was edmund burke who said that every bit counts in in a crowdfunded process like arthur so thanks for mentioning that great to everybody that joined us thank you very much we'll see you the next time on state of the nation thank you <laughs>